Greetings friends around the world. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel. Today I'd like to talk about Israel 1948 and prophecy. Now the nation of Israel declared its independence on May 14, uh, 1948 and it was internationally recognized as such May 1st, 1949. Now various Protestant prophecy watchers have claimed that that particular date perhaps fulfills what Jesus talked about regarding the parable of the fig tree in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Gospels. Now, is that the case? Was there anything prophetically important about the formation of the state of Israel? Well, I do believe there are some things that are prophetically important. I would like to comment that some of the things that are purported to be important for that are simply not the case. Now, one thing to, to mention at the beginning is that while the, the nation of Israel is predominantly composed of people of Jewish heritage, not all Israelites are Jews. Jacob, who was renamed Israel, had 12 sons, and he actually adopted two of his sons, Joseph's sons. We ended up with 13 tribes of Israel. In 1 uh, Kings of 11.31, you can read that 10 of the tribes were separated uh, because of issues uh, related to Solomon, and they ended up going to uh, uh, Jeroboam. And in, in the Old Testament, you'll see sometimes that Israel and Judah fought each other. But basically, those that we call Jews today are supposed to be descended from the tribe of Judah. Now, there was a prophecy that even though uh, the Jews are only one of the tribes, that sometimes they would be called Israel. Now, I'm going to read this prophecy. This is from Isaiah 48, verse 1. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel and have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah. So this has happened today. The people who have come from Judah have been called Jews. Now, the reality is, in the New Testament, it was also known that there were all these other tribes. There were 13 tribes. And James, in James 1, I'm going to read this, recognizes this, because he starts off saying, James, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So James knew that not all of those children of Israel were in the Judea-Palestine area back then. There were 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. Well, what's this have to do with the, the tiny nation of Israel and prophecy? Well, many Protestant prophecy watchers think that certain things happened in 1948 to fulfill certain prophecies in the Bible, many of which are really not applicable. Now, the so-called Christian Research Journal commented that uh, many of the Protestants in the United States believe it's their biblical responsibility to support the contemporary Jewish state of Israel. And they call this view uh, Christian Zionism. They say the Pew Research Center put out a figure at 63% for white evangelicals. Anyway, it says this view holds that the regathering of the Jewish people to Israel since 1948 is the miraculous fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham to establish Israel as a nation forever in Palestine. Tim LaHaye's Left Behind novels, together with books written by Hal Lindsey, Pat Robertson, and many others, which propound this view, have sold well over 100 million copies. So 100 million copies of books out there, at least, for saying something that's not really the case. Now, this uh, particular journal article says, many, however, have been left increasingly uneasy about the idea that the Jew God would bring the Jewish people back to Palestine while they're in unbelief, since that's why they were exiled in the first place. And... They don't feel that this nation matches the picture of a God-fearing Israel that Christian Zionists find in their literal interpretation of the ancient prophecies. So in other words, this so-called Christian Research Journal says, look, there are people who believe this, but if you actually believe what the Bible says, it doesn't make any sense because the Jews in Israel are not so much closer to God than those they got exiled in the first place. I'd like to read a couple of passages actually several, that some people who believe the nation of Israel's formation in 1948 helped fulfill. One author cites Isaiah 43, starting in verse 5. I'll read the translation he has. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. 
So this particular author then says, Isaiah lived 2,700 years ago. Beginning at that time, Israel had been conquered quite a bit, but in the last century, millions have returned to Israel. So he's trying to say that this has been fulfilled starting 1948 or maybe in the late uh, 1800s. He then cites uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, verses 3 through 6, which I think disproves him even further. Let me read this one. I will gather myself, I will gather the remnant of the flock, my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up David, a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live safely. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Well, Israel is not dwelling safely. Uh, they still have terror. And King David has never been raised up to, to rule them. Now, this same source, after it showed some particular graph of how many people they thought were going to go into Israel, actually says 93.5% of the Jews in the world will end up in Israel by 2012. I wonder how true this will turn out to be. This is what this website said. Well, the prediction is clearly an error. It's currently estimated that there's between 14 million, about 14 million, about 18 million uh, Jews on the world, and just over 6 million live in the nation of Israel. So the vast majority of Jews, recognized Jews in the world, do not live in the nation of Israel. I believe that the amount of Jews is actually higher than that. And actually, if you look at the other 12 tribes of Israel. There's hundreds of, at least hundreds of millions of descendants of Israel on the planet right now, and about 6.1 million supposedly live in Israel, plus or minus. This prophecy has not been fulfilled to all the children of Israel coming back to the land. Now, I found another article titled, 10 Prophecies Fulfilled in 1948. And one of the headlines is, the people of Israel will return to their land, and this person starts referring to Ezekiel 34, 13. So let me read some of what this person wrote, and then I'll go to the Bible itself. In Ezekiel 34, 13, a prophet said that God would gather the people of Israel scattered throughout the world and bring them back to their own land. After many centuries of dispersion, hundreds of thousands of Jews returned to their ancient homeland beginning in the late 1800s. But millions more returned after Israel was declared independent in 1948. In other words, millions of exiles re return to their ancient homeland, which is now truly their own land. In a sense, it's now a sovereign Jewish state. So this is this proof, one of the ten proofs that 1948 was so important. But what, was what happened in Israel really a fulfillment of the prophecy in Ezekiel 34? Well, I'd like to read some passages in Ezekiel 34. I'll read uh, verse 13, which this particular author cited, but I'm going to read some others as well, because I believe it's clear that this person took a scripture out of context and totally misinterprets it. Ezekiel 34, starting verse 13. And I will bring them uh, from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and the valleys and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be high on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed rich pasture in the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek which was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen that what was sick. I'll destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Well, Israel's enemies, the fat and the strong perhaps referred to here, have not been destroyed. These prophecies, such as this one in Ezekiel, are for after the Great Tribulation. But uh, various ones believe that these have been fulfilled already. Uh, are being fulfilled right now, and this is not the case. Now, you could read more of the passage uh, in Ezekiel 34, which will verify what I just said, but I want to go to uh, uh, verse 24 for a moment, same chapter. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Well, that has not happened. Now, you might say, well, maybe that's an allegory, and it's not really going to be David, okay, if you don't want to believe it literally, whatever. Well, let's look at the next few passages, because the next few passages also prove, beyond a doubt, that the formation of the nation of Israel in 1948 does not fulfill these prophecies. 
I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. That simply has not happened. Israel has not been safe since 1948. Continuing verse 26. I'll make them in all places around my hill a blessing. I will cause showers to come down in their season. There'll be showers of blessing. Then the trees of the field will yield their fruit. The earth yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hands of those who enslaved them. They shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell safely, and no one will make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown. They will no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles any more. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, and my people, says the Lord God. Well, the nation of Israel does bear shame from Gentiles. There are resolutions the United Nations against Israel all the time. There are other actions and trade policies against the nation of Israel. It affects them all the time. People are trying to shame them all the time. But more importantly, when you look through all this, we know that not only does Israel not dwell safely, so that shows us isn't talking about the nation of Israel, but the people in the land of Israel have not turned to God. They're supposed to do that completely, and they have not done that. The tiny nation of Israel is simply not doing this. Now, what about the parable of the fig tree? I'm going to read something from uh, Hal Lindsey, who is one of the authors who's promoted this. Prophecy. Why is the subject so popular today? One word. Israel. You see, none of the, these, the prophecies concerning the end times were relevant, much less understood, until Israel became a nation again in 1948. This parable concerning the fig tree, Jesus told his disciples that when it begins to bring forth leaves, they will know summer is near. In that same way, he said, the generation that saw all the signs he listed occurring within the same time span, increasing frequency and intensity, should recognize his coming is near. Many of those signs involved the nation of Israel, but before there actually existed the nation of Israel, none of them made sense. I also saw Hal Lindsey do something about why 1948 was so prophetically important. He went through all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to go to something else in that in a few moments. Uh, here's from another source. There's one main event in Bible prophecy that had to happen to usher in the last days or the time of Jacob's trouble. And that event happened May 14, 1948, which is when the nation of Israel was declared. Then this person tells you to look at the parable of the fig tree. He says that's what's known as a fig tree prophecy. Here's another uh, source. Israel, the fig tree, has put its leaves and been reborn as a nation. Therefore, the coming of Christ draws near. Luke 21.32 says this generation would not pass. The generation between 70 and 100 years. Israel is established again May 15, uh, 1948. Jews are still immigrating back to Israel from nations far and wide, just like the Bible said they would. Now, certain sources, uh, including uh, the one I just looked at, said that there's statements related to figs that are related to the nation of Israel. Therefore, Jesus' parable relates to the nation of Israel. Well, let's read one about figs in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 24, uh, starting in verse 2. You can follow along. One basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. The Lord said to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, The figs, the good figs, very good, and the bad, very bad, they cannot be eaten, they're so bad. Verse 4. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I'll acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I sent out of the place for their own good to the land of the Chaldeans. Now notice that God tries Israel in with the good figs that are to be brought back. Um, and it makes little sense that the current nation of Israel, which does not seem to be closer to God than what happened in Jeremiah's day, could possibly be that. And how can you prove that? Folks, just taking my word for it. Well, continue what else it says in Jeremiah uh, 24, starting in verse 6. I'll set my eyes on them for good. I'll bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to, to know me, that I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I'll be their God, so they'll return to me with their whole heart. This has clearly not happened. The nation of Israel has not turned to God with their whole heart, and God has allowed them to be plucked up. 
Well, what do you mean? Some of the land that they've had, settlers have been plucked up, some land has been given back to the Arabs. They haven't gotten their land safely. This has simply not happened. Now, the fig tree prophecy that various Protestants refer to is called the fig tree prophecy in the Bible. It's mentioned in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm only going to read the one in uh, Matthew today, but you can also read the account in Mark 13, uh, 28 to 30, or Luke uh, 21, 29 to 32. We're going to go to Matthew 24, start with verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch is already tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, what are the, all things that Jesus referred to? Is it talking about Israel? Now we'll get to that in a moment. But I'd like to read something from the uh, uh, Protestant Baptist scholar, Dr. Uh, Wolverd. He referred to those scriptures and says, A common interpretation has been interpreted the fig tree as a type of Israel and the revival of Israel as a budding of the fig tree. There is no scriptural basis. That's true. There is no scriptural basis for that. Now, Jesus noted that the events that he talked about in Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21 were going to happen within the same generation. Now, according to Smith's Bible Dictionary, the generation is between 30 and 40 years. Now, you can argue about how long that would be, but if you look at, for example, uh, Job 42, 16, uh, let's, let me just go ahead and read it. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and his grandchildren for four generations. You divide 140 by 4, you get about 35 years. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. Now, it's possible that a generation is biblically longer. It would not seem to be over 70 years, uh, or maybe uh, at the most 80. But 70 would seem to be sort of the maximum, and that would be based on what you can read in Psalm uh, 90, verse 10. Now, the problem that the prophecy watchers have going to 1948 is if a generation is longer than 70 years then their interpretation falls apart based on that and the reality is that there's no way the great tribulation is going to start before uh, uh, 2018 uh, and because of that it's I don't believe that this is possibly referring to the generation the formation of Israel in 1948 the generation Jesus is talking about but you don't need to argue about how long a generation is Jesus said all these things would take place now if you look at what he talked about in Matthew 24 what you don't see is uh, that the nation of Israel was the first thing that formed if you go to there let's start in Matthew 24 verse 4 Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. You hear of wars, rumors of wars. See, you're not troubled, for these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Well, the first event that Jesus talked about here was to be careful about religious deception, uh, which I believe... Specifically, this happened throughout the ages, but more specifically in terms of the beginning of sorrows has to do with the ecumenical deception that started to happen. He did not say the formation of the children of Israel, the nation of Israel. He didn't allude to that directly or indirectly there. Uh, verse 9, they'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended, betray one another, hate one another, false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will bound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will preach to the, all the world a witness to all nations, then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let whoever reads understand, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Now what's this got to do with anything? A lot. Jesus said, when you see all these things take place, uh, that will happen in that generation. Well, the first event had to do with religious deception. Israel essentially is alluded to here in verse 15. Why? Because the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in a holy place currently is in territory that the nation of Israel has. 
furthermore, if you go to uh, the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 11, I'd like to read verse 31. Daniel 11, verse 31 says, uh, And forces are going to be mustered by him, one called the king of the north, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortresses, and then take away the daily sacrifices, and place there the abomination of desolation. The reason I mention that is, yes, Israel was necessary to form in order to have the sacrifices to be resumed so they could be stopped. But again, of the events listed, Jesus doesn't list that, the starting of the sacrifices, as an event. He's listing something related to the end of the sacrifices. This is when the abomination of desolation is uh, spoken of by Daniel. That's what Jesus said was a sign, but that wasn't the first one. It was one of the later ones. Now, years ago, I uh, wrote that I believe that it's possible, because of some meetings the Eastern Orthodox Church had, some of their leaders did, that the uh, beginning of sorrows could have began September 19th, uh, 2009, or shortly thereafter. Um, I told a presiding evangelist of a church I was in at the time that, and shortly after I did that, or not too long after I did that, his church started to say the beginning of sorrows began. Now, if the beginning of sorrows began in 2009, then there's plenty of time in this generation to see further signs fulfilled. And we are seeing prophetic signs fulfilled all the time. One of the problems, however, is that one of the first signs that Jesus pointed to I believe is the ecumenical agenda. If you look at the four types of sorrows Jesus mentioned in the beginning of sorrows, they tie in with the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation 6, 1, with the ride of the uh, white horse, uh, the one of ecumenical or false religion. Now, there's always been ecumenical false religion, but we're seeing an increase of this. We're seeing more and more acceptance of this. Acceptance of this. We're seeing Protestants accept this more and more. Uh, the Lutheran Church has officially, essentially, accepted this. You've got leaders of the Protestant world like uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Rick Warren, and Joel Osteen, for example, who have also started to accept this. They don't, they don't tend to see this. Now, while the formation of Israel was needed for the fulfillment of certain prophecies, 1948 formation of itself did not trigger this generation. Uh, Jesus did refer to the fig tree, but I don't believe that fig tree refers to the formation of Israel in 1940. It simply doesn't have to. Yes, we did need uh, the state of Israel for certain prophecies to take place, but I don't believe using the 1948 time as a date to uh, track prophecy time from makes sense because the nation of Israel wasn't specifically mentioned in my view, in Jesus' words in Matthew, until Matthew 24, 15, which is well after the beginning of sorrows, and after the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to the world of witness, which I don't believe has yet been totally fulfilled. Now, Jesus is coming, and Bible prophecy is going to be fulfilled. But please do not rely on Protestant traditions that 1948, in the formation of Israel, fulfilled the parable of the fig tree. Jesus said when he gave that fig tree parable, when you see all these things take place, in the first several, did not directly have to do with the formation of the nation of Israel. Don't believe tradition over the Bible. Believe what your Bible says. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel.